so excited to be with, yes I am, to be with my friend. This is Cheryl Aronson, Schmooze Jazz Magazine, and we are at the Catalina Jazz Club. Yes, we are. And Mr. Larry Dunn is sitting next to me because he is a special guest tonight for Kayleen Peoples' Romantic Bossa Nova. So... Larry Dunn, so nice to see you. Tell you. everybody how you've been during this time. Busy. Talk about no, it. No, just, you know, working on our music. We actually uh, did the NAMM show in 2020. Yes. And that was awesome. You know, I was That's on the big stage with the uh, filling games. Earth, and, yes. And then they, they had uh, Shalita. Shalita. Shalaya. Shalaya. Yes. Uh, uh, um, you got Kenny Loggins. Yes. It was great. Uh, they had some younger people doing some right. rap. And then uh, Philip Breen and Ralph came, and that was off. Then the next day, we were at the Casio booth with me, Louisa, Procton, Romy, Howard, and and, uh, and Keith. Somebody took a, a like an aerial picture. Oh, they that's said it was right. the, the most people ever at a NAM booth uh-huh. ever. Right. And why not? Because you're Mr. Larry well, Don. Why not? not? <laughs> and then uh, the 22nd, and that was the 19th Sunday, the 22nd. Uh, Luis and I got on an airplane and we went to uh, London. They took us straight off the plane to Abbey Road. Yeah, we did a video there for our girlfriend who works there. We participated in her album, so she wanted us to be in the video. It was great. And from there, we a couple days. Then we went to Holland, a couple days with Patrick. Uh, then back to Macedonia, where we put live strings on Luis's new song. Oh, I can't wait. Uh, yes. Oh, it's auto. Eddie, Del- uh. Eddie Dobaro did the string arrangement on that. Mm-hmm. I do string it was so nice to have Eddie, you know, he's, he's the cat, as they say. So that was awesome. We had met up with the president again mm-hmm. and actually prayed with him and his son. And oh. it was awesome. And then we put the strings on and we came back to London. We spent the night, got up the next morning, went to Heathrow. Yeah. So the little guy at the, at the luggage thing, he goes, <laughs> he said, so uh, anybody mess with your luggage beside you? No. You guys pack? You? Yes. He said, so um, did you just come back from China? I said, Hell no. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I mean, you know, uh, we knew about it. Right. But, man, we were all over, so we were very blessed. You yeah. know, even Mike Martin from Casio was talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of people at, at uh, NAM. I know. And I was there with you, Larry. You're right. Yeah. And they're talking about right? Bill and him. Were talking about, we bit the bullet. And I said, man, that's God's providence, you know, yes. because. But, yeah, this whole thing is wild. But we just working on our music and. Studying and yes. doing our ministry and wonderful. You know, we miss you. I miss see. you too, I Larry. Oh, thank you. You never stop, do you? No, I don't can, stop. Can nothing. You don't. No. Know, so you're here tonight, and you're gonna play with Kayleen. Let's talk about romantic bossa nova. What songs are you gonna be playing? I don't know. Oh. No, I, just, <laughs> oh, I think I'm just doing. Actually, the Bunny and Kayleen asked me to do one of my own songs. Oh. So we. Kind of ran over running for a couple of seconds. Running that was on the nineties yeah. from the All in All album. Right. It was me and Maurice and Eddie Del Barrio, and uh, so that's going to be nice. And then yeah. so nice. And uh, at the end of the night, I think we're going to do Jinji. I love that song. Oh, you so play pretty. it so beautifully oh, too you. with Kaylee. You know, I don't know if everybody knows this. Larry Dunn has some jazz in his background. Tell everybody about that, Larry. That's my thing. <laughs> no, you know, I was just telling uh, the keyboard player that I said, man, when I was a kid, I used to listen to my father's uh, jazz records, especially Jimmy Smith, because right. they were just playing Jimmy Smith right. out of Jimmy Smith and Kenny Burrell. Right. And I would, they didn't have amazing slow downers then, but I figured it out. I would take the turntable and turn it from 33 and a third to 16 <laughs> and learn those riffs. How old were you? Uh, 11. Wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah, about 10 or 11. Actually, you know you, you know the story. When yes. I was 11, me and here, my bass player, had a band. I was 11 and he was 13. Right. And we were doing Jimmy Smith and Kenny Burrell and uh, Hugh Master Kayla, all instrumental. And then we went to this place where they let the young kids go and hear music. And there was a band. They had three singers on stools. And was Philip Carl Caldwell and uh, Winston, I can't remember his last name, 100 years ago. <laughs> and uh, so we pulled them with us and kind of mixed bands. And we went all over Colorado playing everything, the Temptations, James Brown, the Rolling Stones, um, you name it, we played it. 
That's, that's correct. Right. And, you know, when we hear Earth, Wind & Fire's music, we know there's so many different genres being combined together Absolutely. masterfully. Yeah, well. So... <laughs> you know, yeah, what a journey that was. You know, yeah, talk I, about I actually met Maurice when I was 15 right. because Philip and I had a band in Hilliard that opened for the older Earth, Wind & Fire at the Hilton Hotel in the afternoon. Right. Then uh, Maurice and Merdine came down to this nightclub that we were playing at. None of us were old enough. I was the youngest one. I was 15. <laughs> and uh, by the time, about a year later, well, maybe I was 17, my mom was letting me play. Even 50, seven nights a week. Missing school and stuff. But that's how you got your chops. That's how you get your chops. Yeah. Like I said, you know my, my, my quote. To be a member of a band then was one prerequisite. You had to play your booty off. They didn't care if you were tall or short, fat or ugly, cute, white, black, Asian, Spanish. They didn't care. You had to play. And we did. Now, is this the first time you're playing live for people since the pandemic? I know you said you talked about going to Europe, but right well, yeah, here well, in L.A. You know, no, we didn't, we didn't play in Europe. We just went there oh, okay. to put the strings oh, on Louisa's song and be in the girls' video and stuff mm-hmm. like that and meet up with the president and mm-hmm. all that. But, uh, yeah, this is actually the first time. And how does it feel to be back on stage? You know, you know it's like you got the butterflies because, you know, we, it's, we've just been in the studio. Mm-hmm. And I'm used to that. Yeah. But I just heard it sold out. Tonight. Well, because of Kayleen and Bunny and wow. Mr. Larry Dunn. That's awesome. It is. I knew it was going to be good, but I didn't know it was going to be sold out. Mm. The, the, the Manny Cake, we're still trying to get stuff right. He's like, can I let the people in? There's a lot of people out there. There is a lot of people. Awesome. Not that, Larry. So let's Scare. You've, you've only played to hundreds of thousands of people with Earth, Wind & Fire, right? But it's always... You know me. Yes. That was awesome. You know what, Larry? Do me a favor. I, lo- I love this story. Tell everybody the story about when Miles Davis came up to you. This, uh, is, a, this is such a cool story. Go ahead. <laughs> Earth, Wind & Fire had just been signed by Clive Davis. Right. And we were doing... I think we already did the one in London, 1972. I think this was now 73. I was like 19. And we were doing the Columbia Record Convention at the Almondson Theater, downtown oh. L.A., yeah. And I was outside. I just met M. Tume, who was playing percussion with Miles. So we're outside talking, and we go in the back door, and Miles is about where he's at, probably about maybe a little more, 10 feet away. And M. Tume goes, come here, I want you to meet Miles. So he walks around to Miles. He goes, Miles, man, Larry Dunn. And Miles goes, he looks me up and he goes, yeah, use that chimney, ain't you? <laughs> and uh, because of Maurice with all that, you know, astrology and all uh-huh. that, I, I knew what he was saying. He said, use, use that Gemini. Use that chimney, ain't you? <laughs> I said, yes, Mr. Davis. And he looked me up and I said, he's a bad mother. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. I can, I can call my mom. I'm coming home. Uh-huh. What else Miles is there? Davis, I know. Miles Davis gave you the. No, I mean, no, you know, it was pretty well known that uh, EWF was Miles' favorite contemporary band. But the fact that not only he knew who I was, he knew my birthday. Yeah. Because he, exactly. he was also right. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was awesome. And then, you know what? <laughs> my, uh, in the beginning, we had the roommate. Maurice and Leonard had their own room, but the rest of them had to team up. So it was me and Andrew. So every night after the gigs, we come back and listen to Miles, 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 Weatherport, Miles, Miles. So Andrew just, we all love Miles. As soon as I walked away, Andrew walks up. You know, he was a, an army bratter. And his father was there. So he had been around the world a bit. He walks right up to Miles with his hand. Like, Mr. Davis, I'm Andrew Wolfe. I play horns with Earth, Wind, Fire. <laughs> Miles went, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> and walked away. And Andrew's hand was still out in the midair. I said, you know when they poured the water on the witch? You know, I, felt it. I felt so bad for him. But what have we learned? You don't just walk up on miles all willy-nilly. Right. No, no, no. But that that was deep, you know. Definitely. So. You know, Larry, I want you to just, I'm going to, we'll can end with this. But talk to out there about how important it is for musicians to know all different types of music and how you know that really influenced your playing well i mean it helps you know just you know there's different it's like food you know certain people have certain dishes that they like and you know like uh, somebody was charlie pride or somebody was their thing was country and western 
You know, so, you know, like, like Chris Brunt, my engineer that I've been with since Caldera when I was 20. Right. He's got a great, he said, the only rule is there ain't no rules. But I say this, whatever it is that you do, music or whatever, like whatever you do, hopefully you choose something that you enjoy. Hopefully something that will put a smile on someone's face and or help them. And instead of just trying to find out what is this pay, I say, you know, nowadays people, they need a job, right? So they'll go online and they'll find something and not take it into consideration. You might suck at it. Right. It's like when Fred Sanford had to get a job because his, his son got robbed by some friend of his that was a car shock. So he, he's going to apply for the job. And the lady says, so what, what are you looking for? He said, well, I don't want that messy like brain surgery. <laughs> like, you know, so people need to take into, you know, what they, what they instead of finding what pays the most, find out something that, that you think you would be good at yeah. and, and, and do, your, do your work, you know. And you practice a lot. Well, I said, you know, with Earth and the Fire, you take away Clive Davis and Columbia Records and, the, and uh, Bill Whitten with the fancy clothes and the lighting and all that stuff and George Faison with the choreography, remove all of that. And we rehearsed our butts off. Definitely. You know, I mean, we would rehearse like four, five, six months before we hit the road. Yeah. Just the rhythm section. You know, I became musical director at 21, which I, was. And, but, but it's funny because people would say, man, that must have been really intimidating. I said, no, I've been doing this since I was two years old. You know, so, you know, whatever you do, do, do it well, work hard, and it keeps some integrity. Very much.